Uh, so we are uh, going right into, uh, right into the sermon now. Uh, we are uh, speaking of that passage. I love that, that gospel passage because it talks about the last trumpet, and that's where we're in, in the book of Revelation. We are in the last of seven trumpets in the book of Revelation. I'm getting hand signals from the back. What? Kingdom kids. Wow, we didn't even think about that. Okay, uh, yeah, so now is the time for everyone with kids five to eight to send them to the front of the church and check them in and uh, go through the TSA screening to enter into Kingdom Kids ministry today. However, if you want to keep your kids with you, please feel free to do so. And if you have zero to four, you got to keep them with you. Uh, we're just not prepared to do uh, nursery ministry just yet. So uh, go ahead and send the kids. I knew we were going to mess something up, man. I was like, we haven't done this in three months. I'm going to forget something. So there it was. So uh, go ahead and send your kids up to the front now to, uh, to do Kingdom Kids. And they'll be right here on the, they're all right here on the patio where we do the fellowship meal uh, so that you can uh, pick them up right there after church. Dahlia, do you have a question? Who's going to be the teacher? I don't know. You have to ask Miss Anna. Anna and Debbie. Anna. Debbie. Yeah, okay. Debbie. Anna and Miss Debbie. Yeah. Uh, okay, so uh, back to where we were. We are, doing, we're, uh, we are in the, the last trumpet of Revelation. The last part of the book is the seven trumpets. Uh, and the seventh trumpet uh, is then the, all these chapters that we're in right now is kind of an expansion on the seventh trumpet and what's happening and what that means. And so last week in chapter 17, we talked about this crazy image of the harlot, great, the great mystery Babylon who's riding on this seven-headed and ten-horned beast, which is, uh, you know, in, emphasis or, or the, the picture of, of Satan and, and demonic forces behind the socio-economic, cultural, religious complex of the world that's always tempting us to give up on the core beliefs of Christianity and assume uh, the, the understanding and the ethics and the morality and the religious beliefs of the world. Uh, and so last week in the live stream, we kind of focused on how the harlot Babylon the Great was a, was a picture of really the false church, of a corrupted Christianity that's become so corrupt it's indistinguishable from the socio-economic religious complex of the world. And we see that happening. We see that happening in our age, but we've also seen variations of that throughout the whole church age, and we'll continue to see that until the end. So today I want to pan out a little bit. We're going to, uh, in this chapter, it gives a description of or speaks about the other elements of Babylon the Great, how it really is the social economic complex of the world. Uh, and today we're going to focus on that and we're going to see uh, that, that awful merger of, between false religion and, and culture uh, and we're going to see the terrible lament of misplaced trust of what has happened to the people who have gone all in and have worshipped that image instead of the image of the true God. So let's read, starting from Revelation uh, chapter 18, if you would please stand for the reading of God's word. And after this, I saw another angel come down from heaven, having great authority, and the earth was made bright with his glory, and he called out with a mighty voice, fallen, fallen is Babylon the great, and she has become a dwelling place for demons, a haunt for every unclean spirit, a haunt for every unclean bird, a haunt for every unclean and detestable beast. For all nations have drunk the wine of the passion of her sexual immorality, and the kings of the earth have committed immorality with her, and the merchants of the earth have grown rich from the power of her luxurious living. And then I heard another voice from heaven saying, Come out of her, my people, lest you take part in her sins, and lest you share in her plagues. For her sins are heaped high as heaven, and God has remembered her iniquities. Pay her back as she herself has paid back others. Repay her double for her deeds. Mix a double portion of her for her in the cup that she mixed. And as she glorified herself and lived in luxury, so give her a like measure of torment and mourning. 
And since in her heart she says, I sit as a queen and I am no widow, and no mourning I shall, and mourning I shall never see. For this reason, her plagues will come in a single day, death and mourning and famine, and she will be burned up with fire, for mighty is the Lord God who has judged her. And the kings of the earth who committed sexual immorality and lived in luxury with her will weep and wail over her when they see the smoke of her burning and they will stand far off in fear of her torment and say, alas, alas, you great city, you mighty city, Babylon, for in a single hour your judgment has come. And all the merchants of the earth weep and mourn for her since no one buys their cargo anymore. Cargoes of gold, silver, jewels, pearls, fine linen, purple cloth, silk, scarlet cloth, all kinds of scented wood, all kinds of articles of ivory, all kinds of articles of costly wood, bronze, iron, and marble, cinnamon, spice, incense, myrrh, frankincense, wine, oil, fine flour, wheat, cattle, and sheep, horses and chariots, and slaves, that is, human souls. The fruit for which you long for is gone from you, and all your delicacies and your splendors are lost to you, never to be found again. And the merchants of those wares who gained wealth from her will stand far off in fear of her torment, weeping and mourning aloud. Alas, alas, for the great city that was clothed in fine linen, in purple and scarlet, adorned with gold, with jewels, with pearls, for in a single hour, all this wealth has been laid to waste. And all the shipmasters and the seafaring men, sailors and all those who trade is on the sea stood far off and cried out as they saw the smoke of her burning. What city was like the great city? And they threw dust on their heads and they wept and they mourned, crying out, Alas, alas, for the great city where all who had ships at sea grew rich by her wealth. For in a single hour she has been laid waste. Rejoice over her, O heaven, and you saints and apostles and prophets, for God has given judgment for you against her. And then a mighty angel took up a stone like a great millstone and threw it into the sea, saying, So will Babylon the great city be thrown down with violence and will be found no more. And the sound of harpists and musicians, of flute players, of trumpeters will be heard in you no more. And the craftsmen or any craft will be found in you no more. And the sound of the mill will be heard in you no more. And the light of a lamp will shine in you no more. And the voice of bridegroom and bride will be heard in you no more. For your merchants were the great ones of the earth, and all the nations were deceived by your sorcery. And in her was found the blood of prophets and saints and of all who had been slain on the earth. And after this, I heard what seemed to be a loud voice of a great multitude in heaven crying out, Hallelujah! Salvation and glory and power belong to our God, for his judgments are true and just, for he has judged the great prostitute and who corrupted the earth with her immorality and has avenged on her the blood of his servants. And once more they cried out, Hallelujah, the smoke from her goes up forever and ever. And the 24 elders and the four living creatures fell down and worshiped God, who was seated on the throne, saying, Amen, Hallelujah. And from the throne came a voice saying, Praise our God, all you his servants, you who fear him, small and great. This is the word of the Lord. <laughs> Please be seated. Go ahead and be seated. Lord, thank you for your word. Oh, this powerful and, and terrible sounding word, Lord. If we look at it from our perspective, just people in the world, it can seem so shocking and so frightening. Uh, and so I, I pray, Lord, that you would help us to see this as people of the kingdom, that you would help us to see this from the perspective of your saints, your holy ones who are called to you for your purpose uh, so that we can see these things from your perspective and see what it is you're doing here, Lord. Uh, we pray that you would help us to see the victory that Jesus has won on our behalf and what it means 
on how we should be rejoicing in him. Help us to see that, Lord. Illuminate us with your spirit. Give us minds to understand and hearts to obey your perfect word as you promise us to beautify your afflicted ones. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, I hope we've all learned some good lessons over the last three months. I'm sure we all have lessons about like what's really needful and value of family and relationships maybe, the value of, uh, just the value of, of being together with the people you love most and letting go some of the frenetic pace of life. Uh, that's a big one, We're kind of really recognizing what we need and what we don't really need and how you can be pretty okay with a lot, with a lot less, you know? Like that, you know, somebody made that awful joke. I, I really didn't plan to give up this much for Lent this year, but, <laughs> but I'm glad I did. Um, uh, one of my big takeaways is this, is we tend to, and we, you know, we can all admit this, we tend to as people, as human beings, we tend to strut around the chicken coop like roosters, just patting ourselves on the back, so proud of our lofty human achievements and the stability of the modern world that we've created. To so much that we, we just doesn't ever cross our mind that anything could ever disrupt that. Would it, would, who three months ago would have thought that you would be like, you know, risking getting in a fist fight for the last roll of toilet paper at Costco? Nobody. How many thought that you would be like on, you would be Googling how to make hand sanitizer at home from your Bacardi 151? Nobody. Uh, nobody saw that coming, right? Nobody saw that coming. Nobody imagined a time when, uh, when something like that could happen. What, it, what I, I couldn't, man, I just couldn't shake the feeling that, you know, um, uh, as we went through this, how just literally almost overnight, God uh, could so easily <laughs> change everything. And that what we think is so solid and so stable, uh, and therefore what we tend to invest our hearts into, and what we intend, we tend to put our trust in and hope on, uh, those things are actually a whole lot more fragile than we ever could possibly imagine, right? And this wasn't even that gnarly of a bug, okay? I mean, serious. 100,000 people dead that wouldn't be dead. That's a serious thing, but this is not what the Spanish flu was. This is not what the Middle Ages Black Death was. If we had a serious pathogen, just think about what would happen to the world and the economy and the social order that we take for granted almost overnight in a single hour. It would come crashing down. I just couldn't like, couldn't stop thinking about that, about how this is, if you really think about it, how this shows us just how fragile the world is, how we really are living on God's graces and everything, all that we enjoy is based upon a stable natural platform that God maintains and if at any time he wants to, he can come up and pull out just the right card and the whole house comes down. We never think about that. But one of the big takeaways from this is now we can imagine something like that. And that's really what this passage is giving us a glimpse of in the future. There is coming a time when there will be a terrible precursor to the, to the return of the king. The next thing that happens in Revelation is the marriage supper of the lamb and Jesus riding in on the white, of the symbolic vision of the white horses with us behind him. Uh, and so this is right, right, right before the end, and it's a picture of God in a last merciful gesture of judgment, pulls the house of cards down, and the entire economy of the world falls apart. And it happens so fast, everyone's head spins. And it's so dramatic and so awful what it does in the focus of this is it's exposing the fragility and the futility of the world and exposing the terrible lament of misplaced trust for the people in the world. 
And so that's what we're going to look at. We're going to look at three things. The first thing we're going to look at is that, the terrible lament of a misplaced trust. I'm going to read a a quick paragraph. This is from uh, Tim Keller's book, Counterfeit Gods. It's actually, it's the introduction. He calls it the introduction to the idol factory. And he talks about, he talks about things that happened in 2008 when we had a financial crisis in 2008. He says this, after the, clo- after the global economic crisis began in mid-2008, there followed a tragic string of suicides of formerly wealthy and well-connected individuals. The acting chief financial officer of Freddie Mac hanged himself in his basement. The chief executive of Sheldon Good shot himself in the head behind the wheel of his red Jaguar. A Danish senior executive of HSBC Bank hanged himself in the wardrobe of his 500 pound a night suite in Knightsbridge, London. When a Bear and Stearns executive learned that he would not be hired by JP Morgan Chase, he took a drug overdose and leapt from the 29th floor of his office building. It was a grimly reminiscent of the suicides in the wake of the 1929 stock market crash. And we probably know those stories, right? Well, but I want to like point out from this what kind of what I've been thinking about was these aren't these aren't people with these aren't people that have major depressive conditions or uh, you know mental illness or things like that. These are these were people who would put so much hope, so much trust, so much value in being wealthy and privileged and powerful that they couldn't even imagine living a life like you and I live every day. (laughs) To them, that was a fate worse than death. And that trust that they put in those things was so powerful and so misplaced that when those things were taken away, rather than just going on living a nice life like a regular person, the only thing they could think about, their mind had been so twisted and deformed by it, all they could think about was, I was death, was death. That's powerful. These, the people lamenting in this text are what what it calls the great men of the earth, the great men and women of the earth, the powerful, the privileged, the well-connected. Listen. Listen to what, there's nothing, everything, listen to this passage. Listen to these goods, the goods that they're mourning trading, right? This ain't toilet paper at Costco. Listen. The merchants of the earth weep and mourn for her since no one buys their cargo anymore. Cargo of gold, silver, jewels, pearls, fine linen, purple cloth, silk, scarlet cloth, scented wood, articles of ivory, articles of costly wood, bronze, iron, marble, cinnamon, spice, incense, myrrh, frankincense, wine, oil, fine flour, wheat, cattle, sheep, horses, chariots. There's, those are all luxury items and luxury goods. There's nothing said about the poor or the regular people at all except once. You know what it says? At the end of that big old list, it says, and slaves, comma, that is human souls. Now, why the extra explanation? Everybody knows what a slave is. It's not like they needed an explanation as to what a slave was. It's because Jesus wanted to highlight not only what slavery was, uh, but the oppressive nature of it as kind of like a highlight into how they acquired all of this wealth and luxury and riches. Just a little glimmer. This not so subtle hint as to how they became great men and the general tendency of wealthy cultures, including our own and us, to glorify self and enjoy our achievements, at least for a minute, without looking too closely at the collateral damage that that kind of selfishness causes, both individually and corporately. It's part of the reason why they're judged, right? 
But here's the terrible thing about this that comes out, is that they are so blinded, they are so intoxicated uh, and, and, and um, delusional from their atta- emotional attachment on wealth and privilege and power, it's corrupted their minds so badly that they, they, they're so hardened by their habitual self-interest that they are incapable of recognizing the judgment of God as it happens. In, in other passages prior to this, there was, you know, no one repented. There's at least a thought of God, or they would curse God and shake their fists at him. At this point, their minds are so hardened in that they don't even recognize God's merciful judgment for what it is. All they can think about is all they can lament is the loss of what they thought they had to have. Um, me and Brian used to go to Bible college out in El Cajon and we would go to this, this barbecue restaurant a lot afterwards and there was a cheap hotel right by there and a bunch of homeless people around so we'd always go and talk to them having been homeless twice those are kind of like my people and I met this one guy who was in a wheelchair, just, just, just obviously just torn up, thin, torn up, hadn't uh, showered in a long time, just torn up by the street, right? And I, I would, we'd bring us a little bit of food and I'd try to talk to him with the goal of like getting to, you know, like maybe sharing the gospel with him or helping him get into a shelter or something. And uh, the first time I started talking to him, he, I would just try to talk to him and just basic stuff, like get his name, story, whatnot, and all he would do is respond by telling me these lurid stories from, uh, from his own personal escapades, which are clearly untrue. And I thought, okay. So I would try again, you know, and we talk again, and the same thing, and then I, and I said, the more I talked to him, the more I realized he wasn't really even talking to me so much as if, as if he had become like a record, like a broken record player. All he could do was speak about all these awful, lurid stories of things that he had done in the past and with who and whatnot. And, and, and I realized, it came to the shock, he realized that there was nothing I could do for this brother except pray. His mind had become so hardened, his mind had become so disfigured by that desire for sexuality and and now that his body was crippled he was in a wheelchair he had no outlet for it whatsoever that he was just stuck in this repetitive mind seething for sin but unable to satiate it in any way and he was just detached from reality in the world and he would just repeat these stories over and over and over again. And that was his reality. Now why am I telling you a story about this guy? Well, that's what's happening to these people in this story. There's gonna come a time when, when everyone who has placed their trust in material things, in wealth, in power, in privilege, uh, in anything that this world has to offer, there's going to come a time when those things are taken away so suddenly and so fast that they're, all that's going to be left is the seething desire for sin with no possibility left to engage in them. I think personally that may be a big part of the torment of hell, to have an insatiable desire for sensuality and no possibility to fulfill those desires and to just be stuck like that guy was, his mind every bit as locked as his body was in that wheelchair. And God says, you know, he talks about the don't be caught in the sins and the plagues and the sexual immorality. Those are, 
You know, sexual immorality is used as an analogy for idolatry. It includes that, but it's so much broader than that. It's anything and anything that we put our heart into, we hold ultimate value to, uh, above, that's over and above God himself. And so in this case, for these people who are lamenting, they're seeing Babylon burning, and the very next thing in the prophetic calendar is their own judgment, and, but all they can think about is what they've lost. Uh, and, that, but, and so this, this terrible lament has become and is becoming for them an eternal lament, an eternal lament of misplaced trust. It's terribly sad. However, it's not, uh, there is, uh, this isn't just unbelievers that have to worry or that can be affected by these things. God's people also can be affected by them. And so the second thing we're going to look at is is the cultural amnesia of the saints. The cultural amnesia of the saints. Uh, These hardening effects that we just looked at, that will come to all unbelievers one way or another at the return of Christ or at death, uh, isn't, those hardening effects aren't just for unbelievers, they can also affect us. There's a real, a real danger for Christians. Look at verse 18, or 18 verse four. God says, he like takes his focus away, the focus of the chapter comes off of the people lamenting and all of a sudden God speaks directly to his saints and he says, come out of her, my people. Come out of her, my people, lest you take part in her sins, lest you share in her plagues. Now, my people, always in Revelation, my people always means for real God's people. Uh, So what does this mean? What are these terrible effects? What are these plagues? What are these sins that we can get sucked into if we lose sight of who we are? And uh, I'm gonna gonna read a a portion of of something you probably heard before. Maybe you've heard it a lot of times. It's from a, a David Foster Wallace from a, his Kenyan college address in 2005. This gets used a lot, but it so clearly speaks about the, the effects of worship in the here and now, the temporal lament of engaging in worship of anything other than God. Uh, and the, the amazing thing is that this is from a man who's not a believer so if, you're ever, if you ever want to question whether or not common grace can bring, uh, can have help, can, can allow, and even, for even unbelievers can come up with uh, clear sight into real things and real spiritual things, this should forever put that uh, idea to rest. They can. But this is what he says. Listen. He says, if you worship money and things, if they are where you tap real meaning in life, then you'll never have enough. You'll never feel you have enough. It's the truth. Worship your body and beauty and sexual allure and you will always feel ugly. And when time and age start showing, you'll die a million deaths before they finally grieve grieve you. Worship power, you'll end up feeling weak and afraid. You'll need ever more power over others to numb you to your own fear. Worship your intellect, being seen as smart. And you'll end up feeling stupid, a fraud, always on the verge of being found out. But the insidious thing about all these forms of worship is they're not, uh, is, he says, they're not evil and sinful. It's that they're unconscious. Well, we would say they are evil and sinful. But what he's saying is they're the default position, <laughs> original sin. We're all born with these corruptions in our hearts. They are, he says, default settings. They're the kind of worship you just gradually slip into day after day, getting more and more selective about what you see and how you measure value without ever being fully aware that that's what you're doing. And the so-called real world will not discourage you from operating on your default settings because the so-called real world of men and money and power hums merrily along in a pool of fear and anger and frustration and craving and worship of self. That's the plague. That's the plague that we can be joined into uh, and, and suffer from. There's this, there's this idea that he's pulling out in here that in a terrible way, 
in a terrible way, in, at least in a preliminary way, that sin itself is its own punishment. In other words, sin itself has the seed of, of, of despair built into it so that when you focus your heart and worship on those things, it will counter, you know, counterintuitively and counteract in ways that you never expected and bring pain and hardship and suffering. Where he says, where he says it's so easy to slip into day after day getting more and more selective about who you see and how you measure value without ever being fully aware that that's what you're doing. That happens to us, doesn't it? Doesn't it happen to us? I mean, it's, it's, gonna, it's gonna happen to you tomorrow morning. It might happen to you tonight when you go home. We go back out in the culture, we're rubbing shoulders with the culture, the ideas of the culture are pressing in, and there are powerful mechanisms out there that are constructed on purpose to get us to habitually desire things of the world and to catch us in those and create, create habit. And so God's call here, man, he's not saying, you better get out of there or I'm going to destroy you with them. There is, like we talked about last week, a huge element of this of corrupted Christianity that is part and parcel of all this that's going to destruction, but for his people, he is saying, come out of her, my people, so you don't share in this suffering here and now. So you don't share in the preliminary plagues of the terrible lament of a misplaced trust. And here's maybe the greatest benefit of being a Christian. And here's where I think this, is, this was like meaningful for us in real life. Uh, the big difference between the earth dwellers, the people who have no recognition that this is God's judgment, that it's merciful, and God's people is that God's people have a recognition. God's people are able to see and God wakes us up and is able to show us these things by the Spirit that when these hardships comes, it's a wake-up call to come out of whatever it is we're placing our trust in, whatever it is we've assigned ultimate value. And so what that means is, here's what that means, is that whenever like real hardship hits or catastrophe or things going wrong the way you don't want them to go or you hit up against a wall, now maybe there's just things that God is doing in that that's unrelated to this, but a good question to ask yourself is, How is God using this to wake me up to the fact that I've placed, that I've given my heart to something else that's not gonna last and that's not gonna pay off or that's gonna bring destruction for me in the future? And so instead of thinking of it as, God hates me, God's punishing me, God's mad at me, you can look at, we can look at those things and say, praise God that his his love and mercy for us. It's this wake up call to us to help us come out of her. Okay. Last, last point is this. How do we come out? How do we come out of her? How do we come out of, uh, how do we come out of idolatry? How do we come out of placing our trust in other things? How do we transform uh, the tendencies of our own in our own heart that want to cause us to glorify ourselves and enjoy our achievements, at least momentarily, how do we transform that into what God God calls us to do, which is to glorify God and enjoy Him forever? Uh, And that's the last part. How do we worship God? How do we glorify God and enjoy Him forever? That's the first question of the shorter catechism that we have for those who recognize that. The very first thing our catechism asks is, kids, what is the chief end of man? And the answer is that we would glorify God and enjoy him forever. And the, the great thing about that is that those things go together. They're not, they're not mutually exclusive. The way to have enjoyment, the way to rejoice is to glorify God and enjoy him forever. That's what he wants for us, enjoyment. So how do we do that in a world that's constantly pressuring us to put our heart somewhere else? 
but to put our hearts in some other place. Um, The answer is, we look at the end of the story to remind ourselves of who we really are and where we really belong. And that's what the end of this passage teaches us. Another thing we've learned over the course of this last three months is we all know what PPE is, right? Does everybody know what PPE is? Most, most of us do. We're, a bunch of you are wearing it right now. Personal protective equipment. There's stuff that doctors and nurses wear and scientists wear head covering their head and face shields and masks and suits and respirators and what that allow them to go into contaminated environments and serve and care for people without risking being infected by the viruses that are surrounding them. Well, in the Bible, Paul, the Apostle Paul tells us that we have a kind of spiritual PPE. We have something that he calls uh, the armor of God, the full armor of God that we can put on so that when we are out in the world caring for people, serving the world, sharing the gospel, uh, it can protect us from all of those mechanisms that are trying to grab our heart and put it somewhere else. Um, and so Paul talks in the Ephesians about the whole armor of God, about the belt of truth, the breastplate of Christ's righteousness, the shield of faith, the helmet of salvation. What are those things? How do we put those things on? Well, one of the ways that we put those things on is we look at the end of the story and we remember who it is we are and who we belong to and where our true place is. And so God puts this picture at the very end of this chapter of this massive party in heaven. This, this is, if you look at the hallelujah calls and the, the rejoicing of the saints, and it says there's, a, there's a, vo- a voice came from heaven like the voice of a multitude. This is millions and millions of people. It's so loud. It sounds like waterfalls and earthquakes and it's rumbling. Everybody is partying so hard. It's dizzying. It's, that's the picture that, that God is giving us as we look forward uh, to who we are and where we're going to be. You know, it reminded me again of, of the end of World War II when the allies would roll into towns and there'd be destruction everywhere. The French people would be out front waving those flags, overjoyed with the fact that the allies had come and liberated them and that evil had been destroyed from their town. I just read a book called Spearhead about the tank crews in World War II, and they were talking about how even the German towns, when they came to Cologne, when they came to German towns, the Germans would be out front waving the Allied flag so stoked that the rule of oppression that had been over them was broken, that they were free. They could not believe that they had been freed. There's this crazy, funny story about this one girl who like just, she, she was in, in set on marrying the first American she saw and she met this infantryman named Buck and she couldn't stop saying his name and she was just so rejoicing that, she, that they were there, that it was over. There's, there's over in downtown, there's a picture of the sailor kissing the nurse from, New, from Times Square in New York. People were so overjoyed that the war was over, that the threat of encroaching evil had been eradicated, that they were just overwhelmed with joy and that's kind of a picture of what we see here happening at the end of this story. There's not any, you know, there's not any concern at this point over the loss of the enemy. In those celebrations in World War II, no one at that point in time was lamenting the loss of life on the opposing side. There was time for that later, and that would happen, and maybe We'll think about that later. But for the moment, being overjoyed by being liberated from the power of evil was so powerful, everyone just went into pandemonium and rejoicing. And God, he puts this here to encourage us, to say this is, this is your future, this is who you belong to, this is where you're going, this is who you are and who your people are. And this is what Jesus has won for us. You know, we think, we, we think, when we talk about salvation, I said it at the very beginning, we think a lot about being saved from the penalty of sin. We kind of, we kind of specialize that in, a, our, in our tradition. We're saved, when we think about being saved, we think mostly about being saved from 
the point when God regenerated our hearts and saved us from the penalty of sin by applying to us the benefits of Jesus, right? There's also the thought of now as we are in Christ, the Holy Spirit is uh, shaping us more and more to look like Jesus as we go along. He's changing us little by little from the power of sin. But there's a whole other aspect of our salvation, which is we are going to be saved from the very presence of sin. Jesus as the victor, King Jesus and the armies of heaven are going to sweep through and eradicate evil and everything that causes injustice and suffering and pain and everything that we have consciously on our minds and the huge weight of it, the low-level buzz of frustration and pain that we live with every single day is going to be gone. And we're going to be standing out there with our little Jesus flags as the armies roll by, just waving. We don't care our houses are destroyed. We don't care about nothing. Everybody's just rejoicing because the armies of Jesus are rolling through. Think about it. Let's just think about that for a minute. Think about the happiest you've ever, ever been. Close your eyes. Think about the happiest you've ever been. Try to imagine that. Like you're going to do a Patronus charm or something. And now, like, magnify that by 10 and try to imagine that, like, that low-level buzz and frustration of all the things you're afraid of and all the things that you can't get done and all the things that you hope you'll do but you're afraid you never will are gone. And all you're left with is just overwhelming joy and a hope that is beyond imagination because there's no more evil in the world. And it's just as easy for you to be righteous in all your ways as it is for you to sin now. That's the party, and that's what they're celebrating. And God puts this in here to encourage us. Don't put your hope in these little things that are going to rust in 20 years. Don't put your hope in stuff that can be destroyed. Don't join in with things that cause tons of collateral damage with people. Um, Instead, we have to live in the world. We have to serve the world. We have to care for the world. So we need to put on our protective gear. Uh, But remember who we are. And rejoice in that. Amen? Let's stop there. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for your word. It is beautiful beyond description. Lord, we cannot wait for the day when you come and rescue us from the power of evil. Lord, we admit we are so acclimated to evil that most of it we don't even recognize. We're like people who live under the flight path at the airport and we don't hear the airplanes anymore. It weighs on us. It's in our subconscious fears and the weight upon us, but we don't really even realize what we're in. And so on that day when you come and pull the veil of death and the blanket of death off of the world, as you say, you will do the sense of liberation and freedom and joy and having been transformed into whatever it is we're going to be will be so overwhelming that there's nothing, nothing worth trading that in for. So we pray, Lord, that you would help us to be people Uh, who would be not so easily swayed by the winds of the world and by the temptations of the world. We pray that you would help us to seek the things that are needful for us. We pray that you would help us to be people that would seek to live in your kingdom and do kingdom work and let that be our first priority and trust that you're going to give us everything we need and probably most of everything we want on top of that. We pray that you would help us to emotionally separate from all of these things we think we must have in the world to be okay and to rest in what we have in you. And we trust that you'll take care of us. And we pray that through that, 
you all uh, use us to bring light into the world. We love you and praise you in Jesus' name. Amen.